Welcome everyone to another observability clinic. What's new in Dynatrace June 2023? We are covering 267 and 268 today. This is really an initiative, Berkan, that you kicked off a couple of months ago. Thank you so much for coming back month after month and uh, walking us through all the release notes, but also the details on things maybe that people don't see in the release notes. So Berkan, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it's a pleasure and we've received a lot of great feedback already on these sessions. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you for having me on the session. Of course, of course. Uh, let's jump right into it. I think I have one or two slides, and then um, we'll see uh, what you guys, what you have prepared. Um, so I think this is always kind of the uh, the overview of right of what we're doing. So product updates, Dynatrace blog, and then docs and tutorials. Everything that you see today here is you're either watching this on YouTube or on Dynatrace University. The benefit of university is that we also upload the slides. The slides, as you will see, Berkan, you've added a lot of links into the different sections. That makes it easy then for people to download the slides and also click on it. Also for YouTube, I will try to add as many links that you've put into the slides also in the YouTube description, just for people to know. Awesome. That's and, great. Yeah, and then the, the, the last thing from my side, there's a lot of videos out there, um, as I said, on university and on YouTube. Uh, here are all the QR codes so you can easily get there. Uh, the latest ones, since we've done the last What's New, I wanted to highlight Dynatrace AI for observability. We had a great also session with Henrik on open observability without boundaries with Dynatrace, where he was showing how to ingest your logs, your metrics, your traces using open telemetry, Prometheus, and Fluent Bit into Dynatrace. Also, a couple of great tips and tricks sessions on DQL time series with Arishan, and also a session on diagnostics, how we internally at Dynatrace actually use Dynatrace for diagnostic purposes. That's it for me now. Berkan, over to you. Let's see what's new. Thank you. Okay, let's start. So as always, these are the channels where our users can ask their questions or share their feedbacks in uh, the community with our product managers, or they can watch all the resources, the, all the observability clinics, uh, tips and tricks in Dynatrace University, their own university page. And of course, feel, feel, feel free to reach out to us via chat, and you will see lots of uh, our codecs are available here to answer your queries in a couple of minutes. OK, the product updates. As always, we roll out our versions and on every two weeks. And in this session, we are going to cover 267 and 268 versions. The first ones will be about the settings updates on our platform. So the metric events that filter update we have new operators are available for metric key events. Uh, in Dynatrace, we automatically identify your problems and root causes uh, with just a couple of uh, that con con configuration via one agent and also, of course, the environment. But for some cases, you will need to use uh, metrics, metric events, and we will uh, going to, we will allow you to have some static thresholds or auto-adaptive uh, threshold configuration to raise your events based on your specific metrics or customized metrics. So for these cases that you will use these uh, events, and these operators are now available for entity filter and dimension filter in this configuration. Okay. Another one is on AWS integration. Now key-based authorization is not available for new credentials anymore, but you can still keep your keys indefinitely. And only China and US governments that key-based authentication is available, then this is the also section where you will see the authentication method in your AWS integration. Mm -hmm. So what else we have on settings side? We introduce remote configuration management. Basically, you can now use this configuration to set, to modify your host text, your properties remotely on the Dynatrace server. Hmm. I think it's pretty useful for hmm. several cases where you don't have access to uh, machines that easily or where you don't have uh, enough time maybe, or you don't want to spend too much time hmm. with using CTL or on the machine itself. It will be pretty that useful for you to trigger these steps directly from your environment once you modify this configuration, you will be able to restart your also one agents 
automatically after that step. That's cool. And the same, actually, the same feature, we will change this part on the documentation, but still I just want to put this here. It's also available via API, and the API name is One Agent Remote Configuration Management API. Mm -hmm. On the one agent feature side, uh, we moved the W3C header configuration section to the new one agent features. Mm -hmm. You will see it under directly in the under preferences, and this is how it looks like. It's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what the next step. Okay, it's about security stuff. So first, let's cover these parts on our platform. Uh, this is the Documentation, as always, you can check the release notes. This the summary of the release notes here, available here. Same for one, uh, 267, 268, and for all other also components or important at different platforms. Here you can find all of them under this release notes section. If we focus on the settings, the first section is about the metric events. Mm -hmm. Again, as I mentioned, that you can use metric events for several scenarios where you need to define metric-related anomaly settings. And here, under these events, you will see entity filter and dimension filter options. So the update that we shared with you is the operators that are available for these two sections. You can see both of them under this section. Let's do it, OK. And after the metric events, we have the AWS integration part. Uh, whenever you connect a new instance, maybe we can use one of these existing ones. Actually, no, let's let's focus on new instance. Here you will see the authentication methods. So please use role-based authentication as of this version. But still, if you have key-based authentication already, you can use them indefinitely as mentioned. The remote configuration management part, so it's pretty easy when you just log in your deployment status. For the ones that don't know how to join, uh, how to find those components, you can always do Control K search and find the relevant application here. And once you click on that application, you will be easily reaching out this section. And for these two missions, if I, for example, select this one, this one on the left side, it will be pretty easy for you to trigger these steps remotely from your environments. Also, also agent, one, agent starts. One, yeah, one, one thing I wanted to mention here, thanks for the reminder, uh, with the new Dynatrace UI experience, the control K and just finding things easily is really a great reminder. So folks, we are, you know, we started to roll out all of these changes. So most of you will already see the new UI experience. Control K is your friend and it's really easy now to find all of the different views, uh, all of the different settings. Um, and especially this one, Berkan, right? I, I mentioned this in the Slack internally this week. Uh, thanks for okay. adding this to it. Um, there was a lot of praise for that feature being able, especially at scale, to then make these modifications centrally here and doing bulk updates on uh, these properties uh, on your hosts with, um, you know, centrally from, from here. And as you mentioned as well, this can also be done through uh, through the API interface. Mm -hmm. That's very valuable. We also had some cases like just last week where mm -hmm. we had to do some changes on the platform, but we needed to reach out to the admin teams to trigger this agent start or this host group configuration. Mm -hmm. But I just showed them that we can do this directly from the environment. So it was mm -hmm. easy yeah. for us in the last couple of minutes, we had our new host group. That's great. And the last one, the W3C header. Mm -hmm. On the left side, when you click on the settings page, you will see the one agent features under preferences. If you just search for W3C that headers, you will see these mm -hmm. two toggles are available for you to enable. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. So let's jump on our okay, slides again. This is not the right one, I think. This is the right one, okay. On the security end, we introduce the host coverage for both sections for third party and cold level vulnerabilities. Here is just one example you can see under your application security overview page. These are these two sections 
and the relevant host coverage where you have this functionality for all, all, your, all your hosts. In other updates we have on security problems, now we introduce view security problems permission in the security admin group. It will allow you to uh, con it will allow you to give that only view problems permission to your users without configuration, without that mm -hmm. per management zone or environment zone. So it will be also that uh, uh, fine tune. I can say that the security permission for mm -hmm. specific users needs. Mm -hmm. This one is also useful, the security policy guides in settings page. So now it will be easier for you to find the relevant policies under your um, the relevant settings section, let's say. Of course, I will show you an example how you can find it, but easily once you click on security policies, you can modify the policies here uh, for read-only or write permissions. And then once you trigger, you will see directly the policies. It's for auto-tagging. I will also show the auto-tagging example with you in a minute. Let's jump on our environment again. OK. So the first one is the host coverage. Mm -hmm. As mentioned, under Application Security Overview page, you will see these two different that, uh, capabilities. For third-party part vulnerabilities, you will see the host coverage here. And the same logic for code-level vulnerabilities, you will have the host coverage details of your environments. And also, Berkan, maybe before you close this, this is for people that have been looking into Dynatrace AppSec, where we uh, really detect and uh, on a continuous basis scan any libraries that are loaded into your processes that are monitored by Dynatrace. And then we are checking it with the vulnerability databases and we can tell you whether you are loading any third party known vulnerabilities. And also the code level vulnerabilities, I think that's a more recent capability that we have. We really tell you if you have any code level vulnerabilities. Now what's that? That is if you, for instance, are subject to, let's say SQL injection problems, right? So we are actually mm -hmm. detecting whether a, an attacker could potentially with uh, bad parameters on your, uh, let's say, web front end, uh, could cause any SQL injection in the back end. So we are giving you both third party vulnerabilities and code level vulnerabilities. And this coverage is really great because you see how much is actually really covered by one agent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Also, for the ones who don't use security yet, it is mm -hmm. really easy that you can do a one toggle switch and mm -hmm. have this functionality available on your platform. Mm -hmm. Just one thing that you can do with, uh, please check with your admin team, the license requirements, and then mm -hmm. you are good to go with all these cool capabilities. Perfect. Um, mm -hmm. The other update is on the account management sites. Mm -hmm. uh, when you basically go to your account management page, as you see here, under identity and access management, you will see the user groups. So for the admins, the security admin permissions, we can easily see with this view group button. After clicking this, you will see the permissions. And if I edit these permissions, here under environment permissions section, we will have the new view security problems mm -hmm. for the granularity that you need on your mm -hmm. security monitoring. Mm -hmm. And the last one, as I mentioned, the last one on the security parts, as I mentioned, when you go to a relevant configuration page, in this case, it is text, automatically applied text. On the right side, we will see the security policies. Once you click on it, it will be directly it's available here, the related policies for you to use your also uh, user permissions configuration. So, Berkan, for me to understand this, because I'm not as deep into all of this, that means if I want to give somebody, let's say, read-only rights to the automatically tags, I can go in here, I go to the settings, and then it automatically gives me the uh, the permission settings, what I need to add to somebody to give them, read, let's say, read-only or modify access. So it's a really mm -hmm. convenience feature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
that's correct. And also for uh, several use cases, we can think this about. For example, you will have your users uh, that they, they will need to analyze your problems, but they also need to find the related thresholds, maybe, or the configuration of their entities. Mm -hmm. So before that, it was uh, before the maybe policies a couple of uh, years ago that it was not easily possible to yeah. give the permissions that uh, to give the users the relevant right permissions. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's always helpful for you to modify your policies, your permissions by following these these uh, these policies. Mm -hmm. And you had to write yourself before, but now it's directly automated here under the security policies for the relevant sections, relevant sections under your settings page. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you also for your comments. Yeah. Let's continue. OK. So you can now assign ownership on the component itself. On the right side, you will see its ownership tag here. And you can reach out to this ownership component directly on the entity itself. Now we have started our Kubernetes updates. Uh, we have important properties for logs, uh, for workloads or pods are shown in the related subheaders. Here you can find them easily under the relevant entity. Also, we have introduced the pod IP address section under the properties of the relevant entity, relevant workloads, pod. And we also have now a table, the pods table. Um, for this workload, you will see the IP addresses available mm -hmm. under this column. Of mm -hmm. course, these are things that are minor updates, maybe, but during the analysis, it will be pretty, it will be helpful for you to have this information directly on the guy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I think these are important to mention also to cover and uh, to cover on this call. Exactly, and thank you so much, Berkan. And, and just talking from the perspective of a Kubernetes admin or troubleshooter, right? there's a lot of great things mm -hmm. I can do with Kubernetes, with kubectl or other tools, but having all this data available, the relevant data helps me a lot to better understand where do the pods run, what's the IP address, um, all the properties. This is extremely helpful, having everything in one place. So even though it's minor, mm -hmm. you said, it, it, has, it makes an impact. Mm -hmm. Also, it's very dynamic that we can, uh, you can, our users can easily see that when they switch from namespaces, mm -hmm. workloads, and pods, they will have the, all the information in one place in a smooth way during that mm -hmm. data analysis. Mm -hmm. In the UI updates, we also have calling and called workloads are displayed on the topology card. It was introduced in the last version, but now we have this topology card available here mm -hmm. for the specific workloads. So this is how it looks like. We will also see it in a minute on the environments. So. Mm -hmm. We also added new alert options to the workloads animal detection settings. So now these all five different events that alerts are available for you that you can uh, activate them through your workload animal detection settings. Okay, let's go to our tenant again and jump on the infrastructure sites. The first one is the owners. Mm -hmm. For this entity, for this machine, when I click on the owners button, on the right panel, you will see the add ownership tech component. This is, again, that's easy that you can add this uh, owner information and the value the team identifier directly from here. So this is basically we introduce this version. One, one thing, a uh, quick quick uh, reminder here, because I talk with a lot of customers that are really excited about this feature. The goal should be for everyone to automatically extract ownership information from the underlying uh, component. So whether it's a host and you're extracted from any host metadata, uh, for Kubernetes, it's very interesting, especially your workloads and your pods. Um, we suggest if you already have some metadata on your Kubernetes deployment definitions that reference the owner, then you can have Dynatrace extract that information. I see a lot of people that are using tools like Backstage and others where they are managing ownership or putting ownership information on their deployments. And so now Dynatrace can extract it. But this is really useful now because not everybody is fully automated. Not everybody has all the metadata on there. So now being able to also manually 
add owners to your hosts or whatever you know it is uh, is great because ownership information tells you who do you need to talk to and it also helps you when you are automating your processes in terms of um, you know who needs to look at a problem because the problem should then go to people that actually own the impacted or root cause entities so that's why this is really great mm -hmm. exactly and this may be functionality as you said that uh maybe it's more useful for testing purposes mm -hmm. to have a quick actions and ownership. Yeah. Okay. Another one is the important properties. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, the clear one. As you see on this pod, we have these now properties available here. You don't need to maybe go to the section. So it's also that life-saving update, mm -hmm. I'll say for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, and under pods table, we have this IP address section here. You can easily understand mm -hmm. the pod relevant IP from this, for example, checkout service. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, for this one, I was waiting to see the, okay, yes, the topology, the calling workloads and the call workloads. Mm -hmm. These are also available with the latest version. So that's actually really interesting. So the checkout service here means uh, we basically show you from our smart skip and topology who is calling the checkout service, but also who is the checkout service calling. So the incoming service calls and the outgoing, because we we know based on our distributed tracing who is calling whom, and that's just really great to see all the dependencies in 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 one spot now. Very useful. Thank you. And the last Kubernetes update on the workloads on the detection settings, these are the five new alerting options are available with the latest version. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So let's continue with the other ones. Uh, we have added a warning on the host page when it is unmonitored and your it, the reason of this is that the host unit quota has been reached. You will see this under the entity that it mm -hmm. says that unmonitored quota reached mm -hmm. text. So it's also available with the latest version. The Docker extension disabled by default. It also has been removed from the menu. You need to use container application and you will see the container groups page mm -hmm. for the data on Docker containers are containers deployed in Kubernetes and OpenShift. This is how it looks like from the environments when you reach this container application. We have uh, changed our VMware settings schema. This cloud VMware has been removed and we replace with built-in virtualization VMware. As for the other components, you can always see this schema information on top right of your page under the schema that button, it will be available directly with that, fun that uh, functions. We introduced two additional criteria for get all SLOs API call. These are management zone ID and management zone. In documentation itself or in the API itself, you will see these two sections are available you can use for SLO selector field. Okay, updates on the extension sites. We now use host name that in the certificates. So for example, you will need to use db.dynetest.com on the endpoints and also on, on your uh, extension configuration. So this is also that we introduced with the, this latest version, I think. Mm -hmm. We have enhanced our SSL support for SQL servers. All monitoring configurations using SSL are required to have the certificate added to the trust store. Mm -hmm. You can see it also in documentation, the required steps. So this is the link that you will have access directly. Mm -hmm. Another SSL support for database extensions, starting from this active gate version, these extensions now support SSL. Currently, this option is dis uh, dis disabled by default. And this SSL also that uh, I think was available with Oracle 
and also uh, Microsoft SQL before, mm -hmm. but now these are also available for DB2, MySQL, PostgreSQL, and SAP HANA extensions. And all these SSF right, supports will be enabled default automatically starting from September. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we can now jump on the blog posts. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, before you jump into, thank you so much for the mm -hmm. product updates. Uh, what I really think is also interesting in the end, we had a lot of updates around, you know, making Dynatrace also more secure as we are communicating with external tools through our extensions. I think that's very important um, because, you know, we are, we want to make sure that every data piece that we pull in or however we communicate and interact with external tools, that this is uh, at the highest security standards possible. So that's good to see. Exactly. Okay, let's jump on the new blog posts. Mm -hmm. um, we have new containerized scientific location. Uh, I think it reduced that uh, the one of these latest releases. And uh, to add this containerized location, this is the section that you will see under your private scientific locations menu under settings, web and mobile, mobile monitoring settings. These two options that are available directly from there. Mm -hmm. uh, but before starting the configuration issue, why it's important, it will be easier for our users to maintain, to manage and maintain their scientific monitoring. It will be uh, given you that additional benefits, for example, deeper insights where you don't reach your machines at uh, via standard scientific monitoring on a virtual machine, let's say. And of course, it will be also, again, that easy for you to have auto-scalable and uh, your self-healing needs for your scientific monitoring. Mm -hmm. This is the configuration. This is how it looks like when you click on that, uh, that button. But of course, all these things that are explained in a detailed way in that relevant blog post, also in the documentation, you will see step-by-step step what you need to do to enable this feature. After you enable this, you will see this, for example, uh, this two that uh, locations for that uh, the specified that you in your configuration, and again to have these results, to have these containerized locations, you will need to check this blog posts. Also, the documentation uh, to see the value of having this at containerized locations again. Mm -hmm. And I think I want to add to this one thing, Berkan, because uh, for me this is actually a critical extension to synthetics. Why? Because we've been promoting synthetics, not just for production availability monitoring for SLA monitoring, but also using your synthetics as part of your delivery pipeline. Meaning you can execute your synthetic tests uh, when you deploy a new version into a pre-prod environment, into a dev environment. And uh, what this allows you now to do is you can actually execute the same synthetic tests that you have for production, but trigger them on demand but then use your own in-house uh, synthetic uh, private location that runs on Kubernetes. So this gives you a lot of flexibility, and especially with Kubernetes, right? You can, as you mentioned, the scaling, the high availability, mm -hmm. this is just really, really great. But think about it, uh, synthetic testing uh, is not just something for your classical production. Uh, is it running or SLA monitoring? But we can you reuse it and kind of shifting it left uh, across the whole uh, life cycle of your artifacts. In any stage you deploy, you can now run the synthetic tests and you can run them from your own locations, which is really powerful. Thank you for the additional comments. Yeah, of course. I think we have several uh, users waiting for this yeah, 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 feature. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's also that really important. Mm -hmm. well, in the blog posts, we have a detailed explanation about how we can use our powerful troubleshooting assistance, Davis AI, of course. This is just a one GIF. We can see as a summary how do we use it. So we are investigating a problem here. On the right side, you will have the relevant signals. And on the left side, you will have the metric and event changes. So we briefly, uh, that instead of firing off all, all those raw events or alerts, we give you the causal relationship with Davis AI. So 
considering that you have billions of dependencies, millions of dependencies on your environments, this will be this uh, always uh, critical that functionality for you to teach your environment as much as possible, to teach Davis as much as possible, and use automatic problem detection and analysis in your for your uh, investigation needs. Mm -hmm. So this is a preview, if I can say. Mm -hmm. You will see those in the blog posts. And if we continue with the, other, uh, the details on the entity page, on the, oops, sorry. OK, here you can have uh, see these markers with the yellow and red colors. And you will only investigate the problem analysis to, for this uh, problem, specific problem. So these are all automatically will be appeared on the entity page, on the relevant components. And it will much more easier for you to understand what's going on with your environment during that time frame, mm -hmm. instead of doing manual analysis. Mm -hmm. for so, that mean, so that means if I if I hear this correctly, um, Dynatrace detects an anomaly. It opens up a problem ticket, and now I can go like in this case on the service screen, and then Dynatrace tells me, by the way, Davis detected that this metric here was acting abnormal, and this is why we have detected this you know, changes uh, where we, we detected a change in behavior and it's now really highlighting how Davis was actually detecting a change in memory, a change in response time, a change in failure rate. And and it's easy to navigate then through the individual detected anomalies because on the right side, you have the list of the anomalies that were detected and then it automatically highlights uh, the correct uh, chart also on the screen to show you how that metric looked like that had the anomaly. That's really good. Mm -hmm. And to detect those anomalies, we always learn your environment normal mm -hmm. behaviors by using our daily, weekly patterns. Mm -hmm. And and then once we understand your normal behavior of environments, we automatically show you those anomalies on mm -hmm. your platform. That's very cool. Okay. Uh, to show the details, here's just one example: the change point with yellow on the left side and event duration on the red side. It is also available in the blog posts. Mm -hmm. You are going to see. This is the blog post. You can read in detail. Here's the documentation and the observability clinic that was released that yesterday. And uh, please watch this. I'm sure that it will be it will be useful for you that, to see from the offline sites. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we have November two thousand twenty-two. Yeah, I don't know why. Yeah. But it no, no, this is, no, no, this <laughs> is this this no, this is actually correct. So this is the one from November twenty twenty-two when we talked about the Davis AI. Uh, the one from yesterday comes in the in the second to next section. So this is all good. Mm -hmm. All good here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we also uh, have another blog post where we talk about the F five big IP local traffic management manager extension. And with this extension, of course, it is uh, essential for uh, organizations to improve their application performance, availability, and security by providing load balancing or traffic shaping services. So it's also important for us to monitor and optimize the performance of and uh, availability of those load balancers. So therefore, we have this extension where you can see, collect all this data, and have dashboard, for example, automatically in your platform. This is also a popular popular extension, I can say, mm -hmm. for many of our companies, it's, uh, for our users, let's say. And here's just one example. If you go details, the SNMP trip integration, where you will see these log entries. These, all these trips are recorded as log entries. It's also automatically available after you configure the extension. And these dashboards will pop up automatically on your platform. And to have these capabilities up here, exactly. This is the blog post documentation. And just imagine that you have this image after these steps, the Dynatrace Hub extension, it will also be available in your platform to wait for your configuration. That's all. Mm -hmm. I think the last one, the last one that we monitor open AI chat GPT usage of uh, your 
specific needs, specific requirements. I don't know, it depends, of course, on your cases, but as it gets more and more popular during these days, that we have this open AI that uh, service integration, let's say that the, for the organizations that use open AI, we can monitor and uh, collect and visualize all this data in one place. We are doing this with all of our existing features. There's no need on Dynatex end. We just show you how it is possible to monitor your that uh, open AI usage, mm -hmm. your uh, environment. This is important, of course, to understand your cost, to understand your consumption, to understand the performance of your integration. And this blog post shows you the details of it, uh, of your integration. How do you get these details? And for example, one service flow of a feature that we have for several years that it is it explains it starting from this service call to the end to the open AI site. It's your request that we are analyzing your request, your performance of your request as shown below. Also, we can understand your token consumption mm -hmm. by adding just a few metrics mm -hmm. in your configuration. And these are all available it's in, in Dynatrace. This is the blog post. This is documentation and the observability connect. This one introduced yesterday. That's exactly. what I mean. the other one is from November. Exactly. exactly. Thank you. Yeah. And yes, so I just mixed up this part. But this is also very valuable. So all the sessions are from Wolfgang are always available for yeah. you guys. So just watch them and then yeah. you will see the value. Don't exactly. think about your use cases. Just watch and then you will have your use cases automatically <laughs> appears. No worries. Yeah, I mean, what I want to say also to this, uh, kudos to to Wolfgang. He did not only show how to monitor if your applications call an external API, like OpenAI, to figure out, you know, how you're using OpenAI, how costly are they? Because obviously you have to you get charged by the, the complexity of the queries and the complexity of the responses. He showed it for OpenAI, but also for uh, TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a very popular uh, ML model that many of our customers also use internally that you can teach with your own custom data. And he also showed how you can actually monitor and observe and get performance insights into when TensorFlow is uh, learning and building up the model and as it is executing your queries. And so this is really great for data scientists that build these models and provide them to, to external tools. So great, great presentation. I learned a lot. I will also watch this as soon as possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And again, so I think it's over, but please share your opinions, reach out to our product management team. They are waiting for your feedbacks. We are always waiting for your feedbacks. Please reach out to our different teams in here that mostly our product specialists that will be helping you with your technical queries. Our current test team is always ready for you to help you in chat. And yeah, I think we are, it's a bit to you, to you, Andy. Yeah, I think, um... If you click to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, I think there's a lot mm -hmm. of stuff that you have collected, right? These are all the links. There's a lot of updates on on documentation. Um, we You'll find them yourself, but also we want to make sure that uh, we have them all in one spot. So if you're watching this on YouTube, also be reminded that you can watch the same on Dynatrace University. And we also will have the, the slides on university. So it's easy for you to then click on this. And then the next slide, please, there's one more. Just a reminder. There are a lot of resources out there. We have different playlists on the observability clinics, the tips and tricks sections, the app spotlight, the what's new, obviously, right? This is the third what's new that we've been doing. We will continue doing this on a monthly basis. And this is my way to, again, say thank you, Berkan. I had a pleasure this week to meet um, a lot of folks from our D1 teams that are uh, that had our uh, workshops here in, in Linz and they were all praising you for the content because this is truly helpful, not only for our customers and users and partners, but also internally. So thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to more. Thank you very much. And as always, um, have a nice day, guys. Bye-bye. Adios. Bye-bye. Adios. <laughs>